Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to our second keynote for the inaugural homeschool conference. This is really going to have fun, fun day. Clark Aldrich, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled and honored to be here. And by the way, it's so fabulous when people are, are commenting on where they're from and uh, even a little bit about their own background. I know you've probably done this to some degree as well, but uh, where you're from and, and what's you, what your interest is in this topic would be wonderful to read. Good segue, yes. So while you are commenting on the topic, please also indicate where you're participating from. You do that by clicking on the star to the left of the map. You may have to click on it twice, and then you can click on the map. It's also fun if you'll put that information in the chat, where, you, where you're located, the time, the temperature, anything that you think we might find fun to know. Yes, general humidity level, perhaps. Uh, you know, pressure, <laughs> dew, dew point. Uh. But actually, it is very serious because, oh, sorry, Steve. Um, the back channel, which is what the chat room is, is just fabulous. And the more we use it, uh, the more you have to rely on me, <laughs> less, which is perfect, and talk to each other. So, you know, please get your hands on, on, on the keyboard and uh, start using the back channel because I, I bet half, if not more, of the, co of the quality content from this session, from this next hour, will come from all of you, not from me. So uh, please use this. Back channels unite. Absolutely. So great call. I was trying to figure out why there weren't any dots on the map, and for some reason the permissions had gone off for the whiteboard. But you should be able to do it now. So you're looking to the left of the map for the star icon, the second one down, and click on that and click on the map again. And this is a nice geographical representation. I know it's getting late in Europe and the Middle East. It's bedtime. And in India, I can't even imagine. So keep that uh, information flowing in the chat. We're going to move forward here. Clark, I'm going to turn the time over to you. Uh, I will be here for any help that you need or Q&A. And we do need to finish uh, by the top of the hour. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I have this deck of slides. And uh, my entire philosophy of education is not to have a deck of slides. So I'm absolutely betraying myself in this very format. So I apologize. Uh, I do would love this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, if you have questions, ask them. Uh, if someone else asks a question and I'm not getting to it, or even if I am and I'm simply, what's the right word? Oh yeah, lame. Uh, please feel free to, uh, you know, to answer each other's questions as well. So again, all of us are smarter than any of us. Uh, and it's a lot more fun and more interactive it is. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, unschooling rules, uh, which is a set of uh, rules, quote unquote, ha ha rules. Big quotes here. Rules um, that I put together, reflecting upon education. Uh, oh, that's, that one's okay. So we've now missed missed a couple of slides. That's fine. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, I've, I've worked a very long time in education in a lot of different forms. I've been a camp counselor of boys for for many years. Uh, I've served on various education panels uh, in various states. Uh, on education reform. I've worked with a lot of nonprofit groups. Um, and then my, my main job is, is designing educational simulations and serious games for large universities like Harvard, for, for military <laughs> organizations like the NSA, um, uh, for corporations, for um, all different kinds of others. Oh, OK, great. Huh, Where would that come from? OK. So, um, I've, I've done a lot of work for a bunch of different kinds of organizations in, in education. Uh, I am working right now in part with ETS, who are the people who are making who make the SATs. And before you go into this too much, um, you know they are really working hard to to rethink them and to and to create new new models of education. So one of the great ahas, one of the great interesting points here is that we're in this just this massive shift and transition and 
anyone who tells you they know what's going on in education is probably lying. Uh, we're just it's just the amount of absolute unheaval is is un is unparalleled in the history of education. So the good news is, is if you don't like where education is, uh, you know, wait five minutes. The bad news is that we sort of have the worst of all worlds in some cases until we sort of evolve past this point. So one thing I've done, and I have no clue. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, so the reason I wrote Unschooling Rules and sort of the, the thinking behind it was, you know, here's a, a typical math problem, which is, you know, how do we move this ball to the highest possible position? So we want this ball, you know, to the highest possible position in, in the map. How do we do it? Well, if you are someone who's involved in total quality management, if you're involved in someone who is looking at incremental improvement, you say, well, keep, keep going up until you can go up no further. Um, thank you, Peggy. I appreciate that. Um, so that's sort of the, the traditional model of, of education, uh, the model right now of education improvement. The problem is, and again, I think the premise of unschooling rules is that we're, we're on what's called a false peak. We can make little incremental improvements, but we're not going to get anywhere near the kinds of massive improvements that we're hoping to get and needing to get as long as we're thinking there. And in fact, uh, yeah. Uh, we're so messed up here. Um, okay. Clark, the slides Sorry. were out of okay. order, but sure. I put them back, so they should be okay. They're ordered the number you have them in. <laughs> um, they didn't go in numerically, so there was three, four, and then is this not five? And six? Yeah, I think this is five. Uh, this is a blank slate. I like blank, but. Oh, it probably just hasn't updated on your um, screen. Give it a second. Machine. Okay. Okay. No worries. See how fast this little machine can cache. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so again, the, the point here, though, is that, is that the reason why all education reform currently is failing is almost because it's designed to fail. Uh, Steve, I think we're still hearing your microphone. You may want to mute it. Hey, thank you. I like having you on, by the way, but um, it's a little too much ambient noise. Um, so the, the notion here again is saying, how do we how do we improve? How do we um, how to improve more than substantially. So another thing that I've been, again, just thinking about as I've been thinking about the notion of schools is you can almost look at all schools right now as this sort of this, mostly this giant failure. And, and most of the school programs uh, are absolutely an antiquated and don't work anymore. But you do have a couple of these little hot spots, uh, special needs students, at-risk students, uh, right now science, technology, engineering, and math, and top students. And so you have these interesting little clusters where people actually, uh, what, what's the right word? Oh, yeah, care. Uh, and so people do, you know, a, a lot of politicians especially do, and I do, walk, I do spend more time than I want in the D.C. area, uh, and a lot of politicians really care immensely about these little circles, the top students, the science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, special needs, and at risk. And so that's why you see a, a huge disproportionate amount of energy uh, focused on these little categories. Well, frankly, all this stuff is, is absolutely in the wilderness. So again, uh, a, weird, a weird situation. As you look at schools, um, it is reasonable to assume a handful of things that are all pretty nasty. And we, we will see higher student to teacher ratios. There will be more students per, per teacher. Uh, we are going to see a greater standardization of the curriculum, uh, especially around the core curriculum efforts. Now, that sounds really, really bad, especially for people like me who have who believe that we're not really on the right path and that we should be doing much more, uh, much more variety of things. However, um, frankly, as you look over the core curriculum material, there's a lot of very smart and sophisticated um, philosophies that are embedded in this, including learning to do and more of an entrepreneurship and a more of a making stuff. So, you know, this sounds really bad and it kind of is, you know, it's a little scarier, I suppose. But um, I'm actually going to argue that over time, the standardization of curriculum is going to be better than what it is now, although not as good as it could be. Uh, greater role of standardized assessments, that's a pretty easy one to make. Um, increased disintermediation of parents and businesses. One of the most evil things about sort of the current school philosophy is that parents are the bad guys uh, or gals and businesses don't get it. And so I think there, there remains this very virulent strain of anti-parent. And again, I'm in a lot of boards of uh, trustees and a lot of boards of, of, of various institutions. And boy, the amount of, amount of hate for parents. I mean, parents almost necessarily have to be set up as 
as the problem. Well, gee, or, you know, for kindergarten, the parents have not done a sufficient job at preparing their kindergartners for kindergarten. I mean, I've never really heard that a lot. Um, it's kindergarten, okay? I mean, the point of kindergarten is to prepare for prepare for the first grade. How can we get mad at parents for not preparing their kids for kindergarten? So um so that's gonna that's gonna be there too. Um greater cuts in budget, uh definitely there. Decrease in non school free time, which to me is probably the the uh, the ickiest thing. Uh, an increase in online learning, which is going to be both good and bad. I think from a homeschooling community perspective it's going to be good because there's going to be greater access to contents. Uh and an easy example right now is the um uh a lot of the, uh, the 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 classrooms that are are offered in a, in a in a broader way. So I think you're going to see a lot more online learning, a lot more online learning that's state sponsored and offered for free to uh, to appropriate things. So that that's going to be a good thing, even though right now the quality is pretty bad, but it's going to be getting better. Uh, number of high school students in the U.S. who fail out of high school now 30 percent will go up. So I think we're going to see more and more. Uh, uh, you know, a less success rate in high schools. The number of U.S. college students who don't graduate now, 46 will also go up. So, for uh, for both budget reasons and other things. So, you know, it's it's um it's a pretty uh, it's not a very good snapshot of where in, uh, institutional schools are. So, one thing that I've been doing, and this is going to be a bulk of my sort of formal notes, but again, um, but again, uh, worth. You know, this is just a a starter point for a conversation. Is I took a lot of the unschooling rules that I that I that I found, and I and I created these through interviewing a lot of unschoolers in terms of what they liked about what they wish schools did that didn't, and what they wish schools did not do that they did. Um, and I broke all the unschooling rules. And every year I've, I've been doing this now for a couple of years since I published unschooling rules into these categories. One category: is standard operating procedure for schools. What are the what are the ideas of unschooling rules that are widely accepted? Everyone says, sure, this makes tons of sense. Then I looked at the pilot ready ideas. These are the ones that the school systems were. Getting close to mainstream, these were things that, uh, you know, you have academic PhD organizations such as the National Science Foundation, uh, which, by the way, is a nightmare. I've served on a couple of, of, <laughs> of their uh, panels uh, allocating grant money, and it's not a pretty sight. If you want to see uh, exactly how strong the PhD guild is in the United States, look at the National Science Foundation grants, but I digress. Um, I'm not bitter. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, then you sort of have this other category where people are acting like, oh my god, this is the biggest spot ever. Like, wow, how, who could have possibly imagined such a thing? And so a lot of the ideas in unschooling rules and, and frankly a lot of the ideas of our communities here, uh, you know, they fall into this category. We act as if they're just like these giant major breakthroughs. Then the, then the other ones fall into the yes, but, but be realistic. It sounds good, but we can't do it. Uh, let me think about it, just not now. And then a lot of these fall into crazy talk of just saying, you know what, a lot of these unschooling rules are, are just downright dangerous. Dangerous. They're they're absolutely inappropriate. Um, they're they're not they're not you know safe at all. So uh, in terms of standard operating procedure, insert sad trombone music here. Blah blah blah. You know none of the uh, none of the unschooling rules right now are standard operating procedure, which is which is probably how it should be. Uh, in terms of pilot ready, uh, one of the unschooling rules is: Is it better to be a great reader than addicted to computer games? We have a philosophy where reading is inherently good, computer games are inherently bad. And that has really gone from being crazy talk to right now pretty you know a pretty normal conversation. Again, that went that this statement would have been crazy talk five, six, seven years ago. Oh no, computer games are evil play people evil places where people kill each other and there's misogyny and you know and you know and of course there is all that, but there's also good examples as well. Uh, and so again it's the notion of learning and obviously learning through computer games uh, and learning through uh, and, and accessing computer games uh, is, is just incredible. And there's no question that a lot of the best content that we're that we have available to us uh, is uh, is in, uh, involved in these computer games. If you go to and I'm going to hold on one second here, actually, if you go to www.clarkchart.com, which is in the uh, my overview too, uh, this is my attempt. On going to um, uh, to to create a, a single repository for educational simulations and serious games, uh, many of which are free. So I'm going to put the uh, link in there. And as you get bored of hearing me talk and you want to do something else and screw around, uh, go to Clark Chart and just you know look up STEM, look up uh, all the interesting uh, simulations and serious games that are out there at very low cost, and they are just so much better. Than any uh, than most classroom uh, environments. Yeah, it's a fun link and it's fun to just poke around and, and, and see what's there. Uh, 
But what's interesting too is again in the corporate world, in this case the government world, uh, where a lot of organizations care the most about training. What's really fun here in a really important context is most corporations have given up on classroom-based training, uh, and they gave up about four or five years ago. So you know, where, you know, the parents are being peddled a solution, quote unquote, ha ha, to a problem that corporate America has already said. You know what? We know this doesn't work. So what's been absolutely fascinating is uh, in a uh, uh, is that when at this point when corporations or other organizations again like the military um, why is cost effectively so is that it well corporations actually have to pay for the classrooms and pay for the instructors in a way that schools don't have to worry about it so actually they uh, classrooms are horribly uncost effective if you actually have to do the math which thankfully uh, or unthankfully most schools don't 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 think in those terms so um but what's really interesting too is that a lot of the corporations uh, who need to teach their employees something, again, government agencies, military agencies, and again, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of the way the military approaches education because they just care immensely. Um, and yeah, and, and uh, my husband said those uh, so corporations are way ahead of schools in figuring out uh, that classroom learning doesn't work. They are, but it's more of a cost. <laughs> it's more of a cost abatement. I mean, yes, it doesn't work, but they, a lot of corporations moved away from a, again from a cost perspective. A lot of the early supporters of e-learning in corporate America were those that did not believe in training, not that wanted to do it more effectively. But <laughs> different issue. Um, so again, the the point here, and I do have one, uh, is that uh, the, the organizations that care the most about the training program are now using uh, you know educational simulations and serious games as a format for doing it. Um, so again, you've seen a lot of a lot of uh, simulations. Uh, so that's happening. Um, pilot ready again. The notion of, of of math curricula is evolving. One of the premise, one of the unschooling rules is one computer plus one spreadsheet software equals math curricula. Uh, I still argue that ex the Excel spreadsheet or any spreadsheet, frankly, the free Google uh, the free Google. Um, or the college spreadsheet uh, program uh, is great, and frankly, if you want to learn to use math really, really well, uh, use the spreadsheet as your as your background and see how many of the rules you can learn. And uh, again, if you uh, every single day I use spreadsheets and I'm often hacking away and doing all kinds of weird, crazy things with them. So it's not a matter of again following the rules; it's a matter of having to do something and seeing how creatively you can do it. Um, so again, this, this notion is I think the notion of math and looking at the silliness of calculus. And telling this is some of the other things is uh, schools are starting to look at. Uh, don't worry about preparing students for jobs from an Agatha Christie novel, uh, School Rules Number Seven. Uh, there is a greater alignment. There's a greater concern about we really shouldn't be teaching kids useless stuff, and we really should think about long-term uh, long-term jobs. And really, if, you, if you care about learning, start with food, and that has has a couple of different parts to it. Um, one. One part of it is is I think schools are really learning that that giving kids horrible food is bad and that's good and Clinton uh, uh, Bill Clinton sort of put a lot of effort into getting rid of soda machines and stuff and that's good but I think there's another issue which is the notion of what does food represent uh, of course you do Lisa and you know here's again, I, I've used this chart on several on several uh, on several presentations and saying you know what's a better metaphor for the current state of today's educational content and media you know are we putting out you know that or that a or b and uh, and I think anyone who's real sick is saying yeah we 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 as as education people uh, have been producing mostly the equivalent of of animal crackers with with pink uh, frosting rather than saying how do we how do we get the most authentic experience possible. Um, and uh, Steve, I don't know if you saw this, but one person, uh, H. W. Johnson, uh, is having problems seeing the slides with their iPad Mini. So I'm not sure if there's a solution to that, but it's maybe other people are having that problem too. Yes, and this is not carrot as in carrot and stick. Uh, this is carrot as in, um, and so a regular iPad as well can't see the slides. So I don't know if this is flash or something or a bandwidth issue. Yeah, unfortunately, these are fairly graphic intensive slides, relatively speaking, so Art, they might hang up on if your system. people just logged in, it yes, takes sir. a little bit for the slides to download. That's what you experienced early on. So uh, iPads do work fine. The slides should pop up. I think they're just downloading. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And you have that great you know, voice of God effect, Steve, so, so thank you. I think you need more of an echo, maybe. Um, 
So again, and, and the other one too, which is really interesting in terms of okay, so so those are the those are are the things that people are starting to. to right now, we're in these areas where a lot of the other rules are are what I call oh my god thought leading breakthrough. And I think what's been got to be the most fascinating thing to all of us education watchers is the total deconstruction of colleges. We're watching colleges absolutely crumble in front of our eyes, and you know we we went from this. We went from this philosophy that every single person should go to college. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of statistics say, well, those, you know, again, so much of school is based on the problem kids, uh, you know, the poor, urban, one parent, blah, blah, blah kids. And, you know, there's been a lot of studies saying if you take these poor, urban, one family, uh, one parent kids and they make it to college, they're going to do much better than, than, their, than their peers who don't. Um, you know, likewise, we still see, uh, you know, st st statisticians and, and pollsters saying, well, the educated people, uh, you know, those who have a college degree or higher. So, obviously, we're still seeing this um, incredible bias towards the traditional view of college. At the same time, the institutions of colleging are crumbling about as fast as newspapers did the last decade. Uh, and so, I think we're in this absolutely fascinating time when colleges are, are being, are, I think we're just going to see more and more colleges simply going away as the model breaks down on, on many things. And again, the goal of, of education systems have always been explicitly to get kids in college. And as that um, goes away, uh, Barack Obama inviting the President of People to the White House December 5th. Uh, this is like 2011 or 2012, I think, so it's a little. But, um, you know, so the anger at the, at the cost of college. So obviously, um, the inability of, of universities to control cost. And once again, the surprise at that. I mean, anyone who said, um, anyone who, who's like surprised by this, I mean, frankly, schools have outpaced inflation for the last, oh, 30 years. And so again, why, why we're all surprised about this right now seems absolutely goofy. But there's one more thing about colleges that, and again, as I look through it. So if you sort of look at the supply side versus the demand side, the supply side is um, there are multiple philosophies of education. There's, you know, if you believe that people can learn in a lot of different ways, versus the one golden path. Boy, if everyone can go to Harvard, man, are we set as a nation. We have the skills that we need. So there's two different philosophies. Um, and then there's the demand side. And from the demand side to so the supply side is, you know, is how do we provide educated people. And, this, and the demand side is um, enterprise versus entrepreneurship. In the enterprise demand side model, the enterprises are going to hire people. The Xeroxes and the Cisco's and the... Um, Motorola, or um, I guess now Google, um, are going to do all the hiring of the organization. So if you look, if you look at sort of college through these two perspectives, uh, you know you get these different philosophies. And one philosophy here, um, you know, the one golden path is one way of doing education, and enterprises are going to do all the hiring. It's sort of what we have like probably five years ago, or, you know, where you have the indentured graduate, people graduating from the necessary, to get the necessary diploma. There's a faith in institutions, uh, and, you know, but, but you, know, you owe a lot of money, but at least you kind of have a job to, uh, to, to get it out. Now, the problem is, and then the other way this model can shift is you can say, well, gosh, if you believe in multiple philosophies of education and enterprises are still doing the hiring, then you might have a portfolios rules philosophy where you say, you know, show me how you are prepared for this job. I don't care if you have a specific degree or not, but I want to see your portfolio. I want to see what you have assembled. And I think we're still seeing, you know, we're seeing some of this too. However, um, you know, one of the great shifts in the demand for, in the demand side for college is, frankly, enterprises are not doing the traditional hiring anymore. Uh, typically, you know, if you are a company, say Microsoft, you're not hiring employees to come in and build new software. What you are doing is you are looking for new small startups that have the skill sets that you want, and then you buy those, and that's how you acquire the technology. So if we have an entrepreneurship demand side model, um, then, uh, then, then all of this really gets way diminished. And now we're having one of, two, one of two things. And one is the nimble university, where you have schools being very, very good at sort of just giving what people want. We're seeing a bit of this, too. But we're also having kind of what's I almost think of as the new existentialism, which is no one knows what to do, uh, and it's just it's just absolutely you know, there are no rules. It's existentialism. It's uh, we don't really know uh, 
how to, to get ahead. We have a bunch of options, but none of them seem exactly right. And so, um, you know, I, I, I tend to think the demand side is going to continue to be on the entrepreneurship level. Uh, so we're going to see it bouncing back and forth between, uh, between these two models. So it's, uh, you know, as you look at, again, the notion of college, uh, it continues to be a, a no-win thing. Meanwhile, uh, all over the world, uh, in like India and China, uh, they're asking this question. If you had to redesign the $1,000 MBA for half a billion students, how would you do it? Uh, and uh, that's going to be, you know, they're answering that question obviously in a different way than uh, we, we are here in the States. So college continues to be this hard win. Then, again, the only surprise is why is this a surprise? Uh, sitting through a classroom lecture is not just unnatural for most people. It's painful. Uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, schools sort of using what is called the flipped classroom of saying, hmm, let's have kids rather than sitting in the big room, uh, paying it, you know, pretending to pay attention, like hopefully you guys are right now. Um, it's, uh, you know, realizing that this is just, just you know, a nightmare a situation for, for learning. So we are seeing more and more inverted classrooms being tried out. And again, oh, my God, what a breakthrough. Who could imagine that classrooms suck uh, going on? Um, other uh, OMG, uh, other unschooling rules that fall in this category, listen while doing. I think, again, this is the other part of the inverted classroom philosophy. The future is portfolios, not transcripts. We're seeing, we're seeing a lot more interesting work in portfolios uh, and people capturing their skills. And again, I think any homeschooler uh, or unschooler uh, is going to want to think very hard about creating uh, long list per, uh, portfolios. Uh, tests don't work. Get over it. Move on. So I think there is this, this challenge of standardized tests. And again, I have the honor and pleasure of working with a lot of the test makers. Um, and again, what's, what's so exciting or terribly frustrating, if you want to look at it, is, is a lot of the people that I talk to say, we know that tests have been overused. Uh, they're not designed for what they're currently being used for. And so there's a genuine concern of saying, how do we you know, improve the quality of assessment? And again, a lot of this is going to be more game-like. Uh, and then finally, we're also seeing some of these kinds of skills, leadership, project management, innovation, relationship management, planning long term, behaving ethically, developing security, and on and on, uh, you know, the skills that actually people care about rather than skills that are taught in schools. We are seeing a lot of these skills. Um, what's 45? Don't, yeah, okay. Um, we are seeing a lot of these skills. Uh, people are starting to talk about them and starting to realize that, hmm, we've developed a you know, gazillion dollar school infrastructure doesn't really teach any of these things. And Lisa's question, can we teach these skills in school? I'd say no. Uh, we can teach these skills in the context of schools to some degree. And I'll give you one example, uh, but uh, it's very, very good. And, I mean, so, so schools can't teach these skills traditionally. However, uh, there's one um, program called Lemonade Day, and this is just one example, uh, where they, you know, kids go out and build a lemonade stand. They research the right place to do this. They, um, they um, actually <laughs> ask the investor to lend them some seed money and go through that process. They plan out the lemonade, uh, and they, then they, on Lemonade Day, they go and they sell lemonade and, and see how much money they can make. And one of the cool things about the whole initiative is they actually get to keep the money. So, <laughs> so you know, and, and this can be done in the context of schools, but not done sort of, so it can be done through schools and in the context of schools, but not really in schools. So. Um, so I think we're going to see uh, more and more blurring of this line. But I think there's, there's a growing acknowledgement anyway, and again, even in the core curriculum, of saying we're now starting to value these things even while we're realizing that we cannot teach these things through traditional methodologies that we have. Uh, and there is one of the purest, one of the purest realizations, the truisms of education is what is taught is governed by what can be taught. So Lisa, your point, if you can't teach something, it doesn't matter if you say you want to teach it or not. So again, how would you teach entrepreneurship, I think, is, is one of the enduring questions for, uh, for schools and perhaps much more importantly for parents who are, who are worrying about their children's uh, future. You know, the notion of entrepreneurship is going to become uh, more and more important. Uh, and again, the, the last one here, the only sustainable answer to the global education is, is a diversity of approaches. And that is really cool because I think, you know, even um, homeschoolers and unschoolers, well, homeschoolers anyway, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, no one ever heard of homeschooling and saying that you did it got all kinds of like, oh, aren't you truant kinds of things. And there's still some of that. Um, but I think there is this, this is, again, it's, th it's thought of as a, as a breakthrough. But the realization that, boy, we simply, you know, if, if you don't have the answer, let's try a lot of different things. And so I think even the, the, even the number of online education, even the for-profit universities, the for-profit master's programs like uh, 
uh, uh, just, I'm sorry, Full Sail and, and uh, DigiThink, uh, I think all of these new programs are really increasing the diversity of approaches, and I think that is obviously just, just hugely, hugely important. Another great sign of diversity is the notion of badges, and this is something, uh, this is an initiative that I've been very excited about. I talked a lot to the folks at uh, MacArthur, at Mozilla, uh, at Duke. I don't really know many folks from here, um, and Bill grabbing on to something way after the horse has left the stable and trying to take credit for it, but, uh, but I'm not there. Uh, and so again, the notion of badges, I think, is going to be this huge destabilizing, wonderful force in education. We're trying to, uh, to de-aggregate uh, very specific skill sets with, uh, with abilities to do that. So I think, again, nothing, nothing suggests diversity of education like the badges philosophy. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, last one, too, and this is, again, one that I think is getting very exciting. Um, Unschooling Rules 26, biologically the necessary order of learning is explore, then play, then add rigor. And this is something, uh, actually Obama quoted this uh, in a speech he gave uh, a little bit ago uh, of saying, you know, if you just focus on teaching at a rigor level without looking at exploring and playing, then the approach is very punitive. Uh, so I was glad that he was he was quoting that. Uh, but it kind of gets back to this issue of, you know, how did you learn to swim? And, uh, you know, and, and it's very reasonable to assume, yes, this is, by the way, Newport Harbor. Thank you for asking. Um, and it was cold that day, as I recall. But anyway, um, you know, the question is, how did you learn to swim? And the way you learn to swim, most people, uh, you know, was exposure. Uh, I'm going to understand the environment to some degree and, and look at it with trepidation and fear. Play, which is I'm going to start screwing around in it. I'm going to splash around. I'm going to do various things. Uh, and then finally, add rigor. So once I'm comfortable playing Marco Polo and tag and holding my breath, then I'm going to start adding rigor. And this truly is the way learning works. And I don't care how whatever you are, you can't skip over parts one and two just because they're inefficient. Uh, and they are inefficient. They should be inefficient by design. And so again, right now we have a school system that's really, <laughs> it's starting to, to, to reawaken the fact that it's like, huh, maybe just proving to everyone how rigorous we are hasn't worked because we have not created, we have not developed competence or conviction in students. We've just created a very brittle, high-level understanding. So uh, again, exciting news, seeing how the notion of play is becoming reappreciated. Um, the engineering students who, uh, according to uh, Allison, have played electronics at very experienced than those who haven't. Yeah, and one of the great things, again, is uh, John Chilly Brown, who used to be the chief engineer at Xerox's park facility, you know, said that he learned a lot about engineering by taking apart his lawnmowers more so than he did in high school at the time. So um, rigor is the final step. It is a necessary step. Uh, it is a key step, but if you if you try to get to rigor too quickly and skip over the exposure and the fun uh, or the play phase, then you create then you create a uh, again people who are literally uh, you know anxious and depressed. It's a very bad model. So rigor has to be there. It's just not the first step. Um, and finally, embrace all technologies. And again, I think we're we're at a point now. Um, that's yeah, an ugly chart. Uh, we're at a, at a point now where I think schools have gone from saying technology is bad to saying, hmm, maybe we, we can't totally ban all technology all the time. Uh, and so I think there is a reappreciation of, oh my god, technology, let's do technology, we're geniuses. Um, and certainly, again, in the corporate world and the military world, uh, Again, you're seeing the role of an instructor and the role of student going away, uh, and you're seeing more and more people who want to learn uh, being either the experts who are giving webinars, haha, like me right now, sorry about that, who are becoming mentors, who are participating on task forces, social networks, peer-to-peer -peer blogs, skill communities. You know, this is how learning is happening in an ongoing active environment in most organizations. Um, and the role of practitioner uh, who has stretch goals, who, again, who are involving in these things, where there is some kind of formal learning, um, you know, serious games, workbooks, virtual classrooms, but they're really thinking of it in terms of, in terms of hours and days. So, you know, there's still a some role of students in terms of sabbaticals and weeks, months, years, getting requirements for jobs. Uh, it used to be in the olden days you'd have experts and they would, ret they would retire to becoming instructors on some kind of rotational assignment. Now they're just giving webinars and stuff. So, uh, again, I think in corporate America today you're seeing the elimination of the right side of this chart, the role of instructor and the role of student, and you're seeing much more especially in this uh, in this area right here, you know, this is where a lot of the uh, 
learning is happening in organizations, and those who can learn well in those environments are the ones who are doing really well. So blogs, peer-to-peer, -peer, mentor uh, students, self-directed learning, social networks, task forces, learning by doing, stretch goals, skills, communities, peer peer reviews, again, one of, one of my favorite ways of doing things, best practices and stuff. So uh, this, and this is all, again, technology enabled, so we do obviously have to learn to love technology. Um, including some of these. And so you know, the notion that these technologies used to be thought of as distinct from education and now is increasingly being understood as being absolutely what education has to focus on, again, is something that is, is thought of as breakthrough, breakthrough thinking from an education perspective. Oh my god, you're a genius. Technology and education, wow. Uh, but obviously, um, you know, this is just, just common sense. So this is a bunch of uh, a bunch of unschooling rules that fall into the yes but be realistic category. Uh, the fact that we have these over bloated curriculum. I mean, really, what school should be teaching is reading, writing, and arithmetic, and that's really what we can teach through a directive way. We can make people learn that stuff if we have to, but we'd rather not. Uh, beyond that, it's really you know we we shouldn't be forcing kids to learn uh, calculus. We shouldn't be forcing kids to learn other a lot of other things. So there's, so there's a real notion of paring down the curriculum into its absolute core fundamentals, certainly from universal and directive way. Uh, in education, customization is important. Like air is important. I think we'll see more customized education programs. You know, we've seen some software does it fairly badly in terms of adaptive software programs that um, based on how well you do you know, get harder or something. So we're seeing some, but but right now the adaptive education programs are pretty minimal. However, we'll start seeing more and more of that. Um, really important though, the notion of internships, apprenticeships, and interest in jobs beat term papers, textbooks, and tests. And I think that's one of the really exciting things here where uh, seeing uh, people doing things, uh, doing activities, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, something in lifelong learning to learn, unlearn, and relearn. I think unlearning is a really uh, important activity, and we do have to spend a lot more time unlearning. Um, and so we are teaching them to learn as well as providing environments for them to learn. So the notion, again, of microcosms, and how do we, and again, the notion of this, most schools try to separate kids out from the real world. Uh, the notion of the school is that of a factory, uh, and if you you know read Jack Welsh or look at Six Sigma manufacturing practices, the idea is to reduce the diversity of inputs so that you can maximize the consistency of outputs. And if you have rigorous measurements in place, you can find the things that are problems, i.e. the things that are more than Six Sigma deviations from the norm. So that's the philosophy of factories. How do we get rid of deviations? How do we get rid of differences in people? How do we minimize the impact of family? How do we minimize the impact of location? How do we minimize the impact, frankly, of of, of you know background and just focus on a very narrow set of, of specifics? So this is where, again, the whole notion of, of the, the other way of doing school and, and doing education saying, how do we increase the surface area with the real world? How can we increase the amount of time kids are spending uh, actually having me meaningful jobs, meaningful projects, uh, internships, microcosms, the whole, the whole shebang? Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, build more, consume less. Again, we have a, a education model that's based upon that's based upon consuming. Uh, it's, it's a you know, again, I'm going to watch a movie. No, I'm going to listen to music. No, I'm going to consume educational content. Uh, and the question here becomes, how do we simply build more? How do we how do we develop a culture that is building more? And again, for the longest time, builders were looked down upon. I mean, you sort of look at them. Look at the number of tailors in America today. Uh, ta you know, tailoring used to be a very important job, and people pick, got paid well for being tailors, and now we sort of ask for us to China, we've gotten rid of all tailors. No one is replacing our tailors in this country. And again, it's either not a problem at all or a huge problem. If you're someone like me, you think it's actually a huge problem uh, because there's a tremendous need for high-quality garments and, and you know, whatever. So, uh, so we've had a culture that has really focused not on building stuff, and schools have have worked hard to get rid of the, the high value building activities because they can't teach it very well. And I think the culture right now uh, is suffering for that. So I think the notion of building more. Um, yeah, we can go back here. Okay. So second to last category, let me think about that just now. So here's some of the unschooling rules that are, are, are out there that are just like really inconvenient truths. Uh, what a person learns in a classroom is how to be a person in a classroom. This is kind of at odds to the, to the other one I have, but there's still this whole um, 
you know, I think there is still a split personality when it comes to classrooms. We know classrooms don't work, but we still think that we can teach people there. Uh, including meaningful work is, is one of those things where if you talk to anyone about the importance of doing meaningful work, they're like, yeah, we know, we know kids should be doing meaningful work, but isn't it better if they draw a picture of a butterfly? It's like, no, what if they really did meaningful work? Well, no, we don't want them to do, I mean, that's like real world, and we don't like real world because it's ugly and unpredictable, so let's have them, instead of doing meaningful work, let's have them, you know, sing Christmas carols or something. So it's that same, it's that just same wrestling the schools have with, um, with the notion of meaningful work that I think anyone who does who does it knows how absolutely important it is in building one's character and developing one's skills and competencies and gaining self-worth. And so, again, the notion of, of education without meaningful work to, uh, to people like myself is anathema. But again, it's because it's unpredictable in the real world, uh, it, it, it tends to get killed by schools. Um, creating these periods of reflection. Uh, learn to be, learn to do, learn to know. This is one of those ones, again, we still have a culture that is so focused on, uh, there it is, learning to know, which is really important. Um, but we schools have been really horrific at learning to do uh, and really horrific at learning to be. And in fact, they're sort of anti-learning to be because they don't want people to be self-actualized. They want them to be, you know, they want to think of themselves as students. So, I mean, learning to do is just like, you know, what the, hey, we, we, we can't do that. So, um, you know, the, the, the first unschooling rules, unschooling rules number one, is this notion of all three of these things are important. And obviously, learning to be, you have things like Facebook uh, and Tumblr and Twitter and all these things that have, all these social media technologies have grown up around learning to be. Uh, learning to know are things like Google and, and Wikipedia. You know, learning to do is still harder to do in a media sort of Silicon Valley philosophy kind of way. So um, what's interesting is as learning to do becomes more popular, as people realize, when you look at things like leadership and management and relationship management and all these kinds of things, um, you realize how useless Google is and how useless uh, Wikipedia is and how useless, you know, even Facebook is. You have all these titans right now of Silicon Valley who have absolutely no clue how to participate in a learning to do environment or culture. So uh, it's fascinating, again, how good they are. Uh, you know, again, from a Silicon Valley perspective at these two and just how absolutely terrible they are at learning to do, which is arguably the most important of the three, or at least one of the most foundational. So it's still, uh, so again, people, people talk about it, they just always know what to do with it. Um, yeah, so last category is crazy talk, and uh, I'm going to sort of end this part of it, which is there's a bunch of things that are in unschooling rules that are absolutely anathema to schools today and are just, just again, are just crazy talk. And one of the biggest ones to me is, is the notion of leadership. Teaching is leadership, and most teaching is bad leadership. There is a fundamental difference between two philosophies and approaches of leadership. It's called directive versus collaborative. There's some other variations there. In directive leadership, I tell you what to do, kind of like I'm doing um, you can see the best learning to do resource, relatively speaking, but not in absolute terms. So I think YouTube can show processes, but relatively simple processes. You can use YouTube for things like, you know, how to light a Bunsen burner or how to whatever. It's pretty hard to um, use YouTube to say, how do I do leadership or how do I do project management or how do I do stewardship? So I think YouTube is fa fantastic at a very sort of technical level, but as you start getting to the more philosophical areas, you know, I want to I learn entrepreneurship or something, then it's not necessarily quite as good. So um, I think it's a, it's a great point there, Hannah. Thank you. So the notion, again, of, of leadership is one of the most fundamental uh, and something that I've been wrestling with my entire professional life. There's a notion of directive leadership, which is I'm, I'm the expert, I'm the keynote speaker, so listen to me. Uh, I'm the one who has the answers. And if I'm writing a book, gosh darn it, it better be directive. I, I'm going to entice you to believe that I am the super expert and that you are not so smart and I'm really, really smart. Uh, and I have all the answers, and I'm going to present to you what it, what it is. And that's a directive form of leadership versus a collaborative uh, view of leadership, which is saying, I'm a leader. That means I'm here to help you. Uh, you are the person who's going to be led. Therefore, what can I do to help you? And what do you want to do? Because, I, you know, I mean, if I'm, going to, if I'm going to be a leadership, if I'm going to have a leadership role, how do I help you? Because I'm a leader. 
And the notion of directive versus collaborative leadership is, is one of the most fundamental flaws in, in education today. And it's really hard to write a book that is non-directive. My last two books, I've tried so hard to write, you know, more open-ended books on schooling rules and the complete guide to simulations and serious games. You know, and people read them and say, okay, but I kind of wish it was a little more directive. So, you know, I'm not sure. How, how successful I was there. But, um, you know, how do you create a book that does not overwhelm the person and take over the role of, of leader, but, but support the person and give them encouragement, allow them to become the hero, not just read about the hero? Um, the problem with directive leadership is it has short term benefits, but not long term. So, if a directive thing to say is, oh my gosh, the orphanage is burning. Let's all grab a bucket and run out and put it out. So, you know, that's, that's a good use of, of direct leadership. But if I say, here's a great book, you have to read it. Uh, I can get at best short-term compliance, but long-term I get what's called reactance, which is a long-term dislike of it. So if a fifth grade teacher, for example, may be using a directive form of leadership uh, and get compliance to write a test or take a paper, but they're actually creating more problems for subsequent teachers. They're actually creating antibodies to do something. So the notion of, of leadership and the importance of leadership is absolutely fundamental and something that, again, most schools don't even accept that as being the massive problem that they are. Uh, so that's one of the crazy talks, expose more, teach less. In other words, how can we show kids more things without necessarily testing them or quizzing them on it? Um, you know, the ideal class isn't 30 or even 15, but more like five. Again, total crazy talk in classroom, in, in academic parlance, but the reality is, I mean, I think we've all had to teach more than one kid, and once you get beyond four or five, you're no longer teaching, you're hurting. So, uh, you know, this is something that's totally, again, absolute crazy talk. Uh, parents care more about than any institution about their children. And I think that's one of the, the most tragic ones today is that necessarily schools think of themselves as being in competition with parents or parents as there to help them rather than schools are there to help parents. And so I think that total inversion of the process is uh, it's just something that just absolutely leaves me with a bad taste. And number, again, of school meetings I've attended, uh, gatherings of teachers uh, talking about uh, you know, new technologies or whatever, and I've been, been part of who say, oh my god, let me tell you about all these terrible parents. The parents don't care. They're, you know, all parents are either crack, you know, crackhead addicts or all parents are super business professionals who could care less about their children. And that's like the two types of parents that, that uh, most teachers sort of think about and these are the stories they tell. So again, the notion that, that that's crazy talk is absolutely tragic. Um, same thing, people should be raised by people people love them. And again, that's crazy talk too. And I think over time we'll start seeing the, the, the truth of that, which is um, the more and more children are outsourced, uh, you start getting a bunch of other problems like low-cost uh, providers and stuff. Um, socialize your children, just send you schools to do it. Haha. Uh -huh. Minimize the drop-offs and, uh, and outdoor beats, beats indoor. And again, I think the notion of saying how do we, you know, how do we embrace the outdoors? It's not factory-like, so we don't like it, but how do we get spend more time outside that we possibly can? Uh, and, and realizing, again, the, 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 the beauty of the outside world. I don't care if it's raining. I don't care if it's whatever. We get wet. That's fine. But, you know, how do we embrace the outdoors more and more? Um, uh, increase exposure to non-authority figure adults. Uh, we're seeing a little more of that, but, uh, you know, the fact that all adults have to be authority figures in a, you know, in a traditional educational model is really bad. How do you create positive encounters with non-authority figure adults? Um, how do you start using all of these more? So these are, again, better models in classroom, whether music and art class, community theater, improv, book clubs, writing, garage band, movie making, startup businesses, World of Warcraft, Facebook blogs, 4-H, Farmers of America, summer camps, libraries, internships, and volunteering. All these things are, are so much richer than school. They provide so much longer cognitive imprints on people. They add to healthier people. And again, these are all anti-classroom. Uh, and most teachers in most schools will spend a lot of time, again, positioning all of these things as waste of time, as things that get in the way of test taking. Uh, and again, I, I think the, the having to embrace these things rather than looking at them as problems is, uh, is absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, homework helps school systems. Students, I'm hoping to see some movement in that one. Uh, animals are better than books about animals. This is actually a really big point, and uh, again, almost w wrapping up here in this far too talky presentation, so sorry. Um, but the notion of wind is something that's synthetic meet something that is that is that is authentic. And again, I, I design educational simulations and serious games for a living. Um, 
And so, you know, I'm arguably a culprit here if 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 you if you use too much of my stuff. Uh, but it's um, you know, you, we, there really has to be this balance of how do we create better and better synthetic stuff, how do we create better and better educational simulations and serious games, how do we do all that stuff even better, but ultimately how do we create more overlap with the real world, how do we, you know, actually deal with animals rather than just books about animals, how do we, how do we, you know, uh, embrace the world rather than just deal with a synthetic version of it. One of the sort of the, the examples I use all the time in the, of a notion of a bubble world is math and saying, you know, uh, you know is math perfect? It's a great quote saying, I forget the exact quote, but something to the point of math is a perfect science. Well, math is only perfect if it is math to math. If it is real world to math and then math to real world, in the transitions between those two, math breaks down very quickly. And so if you say, again, I'm driving 60 miles an hour for three hours, how far have I driven? Well, 180 is the mathematically perfect uh, answer, but I guarantee you that no one who's been driving for three hours around 60 miles an hour actually drove 180 miles. So the perfection of math falls apart very quickly. Likewise, again, unless you're dealing with the nitty gritty, the ugliness of reality or the beauty of reality, uh, then you're really missing out on on real education. You're just you're just doubling down on synthetic. Um, so the notion, again, animals are better than books about animals as a pithy way of saying, you know, how do we increase the reality of things and not use the synthetic doppelgangers? Uh, you know, this is not a pipe is the great old French, uh, the French uh, painting, but um, you know, there's a difference between a painting of a pipe and a real pipe, and we do have to, as often as we can, err on the side of reality. Even on lemonade day, that example I gave before, I guarantee you that a lot of schools say, why don't we just use a computer simulation of a lemonade day stand or a lemonade stand? Why do we need a real thing? And I think, again, that's going to be the influence that the uh, people are going to have to fight against. Uh, okay, okay. All right, that's good. So I think we're... But so let me just end on a big note, on a big premise, on sort of the thing that I've most learned about about education, and that is that education is individualistic. And obviously, I, I hear a collective duh uh, from you guys, and, and you should, and that's fine. But let me get a little more specific, uh, which is for a good life, align what you are doing with what you do well, with what you want to do, with what you think is important to do. So that kind of, to me, sums up education. And I'll go into a little more detail here. So we're, we're all individuals, and we all have skills. They're all things that we do better than anyone else. For example, I'm not the best speech giver, and I, I can deal with that. Um, so that's, that's not really a skill. But, um, so we all have skills, and we all need to figure out what those skills are, and where are we better than anyone else in the entire world. We also have beliefs and passions. We have things that we care about more than whether it's puppies and animals and, and, and environment or whether it's home and family or whether it's culture or whether it's in some people religion and some people it's environmental, whatever. What are the things that we just, gosh, care so much about that we just spend our time doing it? So we figure out what our skills are. We figure out what our beliefs and passions are, and now we go through a series of subsequent projects to say, how do we test out this naive perspective? How do we enrich our skills? How do we get credit for our skills? Uh, and how do we start building towards um, working towards our beliefs and passion? And then finally, how do we develop a career and a lifestyle that connects uh, skills and passions? And so to me, this is education. I don't care about, I mean, if colleges help, great. If they don't, who needs them? If schools, traditional schools help or not, whatever. Almost it does not matter. This is the absolute essence of what education needs to be and must be. And as long as initiatives support this fundamental truth of education, they will be successful, like badges, for example, like Mozilla's badge initiative. And as long as initiatives don't support this, perhaps like MOOCs, um, then, then they're gonna, then they're gonna hit, hit some issues. So, uh, to me, this has become the, the, my compass for education. And then you can look at kind of the opposite too. So again, you know, if you are good at math and logic and you've discovered that you can do a lot of programming assignments, you can create a software company that helps disadvantaged people find meaningful work. Uh, you know, that, that is a successful life. And again, to the degree schools can help, wonderful. To the degree schools can't get them out of our way. Same thing here. We can be good at biology and we can practice 4-H, uh, become a veterinarian and really attach ourselves to our love of animals. Great. And again, whatever helps us do that, wonderful. Whatever gets in our way and distracts us, then how dare they? We should be absolutely insulted. So again, this is the absolute you know, this is what we should all be thinking about in education. And the corollary is, is sort of how it is today, which is there is one path that we consider to be good. 
And there's a certain very, very finite skill set. And if you are matched up with the skill set, congratulations, you win. And if you don't, you don't. Uh, and there are certain, uh, a certain finite number of projects to support it, a finite number of careers, and a finite number of beliefs and passions that are considered to be kind of good, uh, which is the current model of education is lottery. If your skills and interests line up with schools, then you win. and they don't line up, you lose. So um, so let me end on this slide and uh, take a bit of questions and answers, and then we will move on. I'm sorry, I spoke way too fast. I mean, do apologize for that. And it's turned out to be a lot more directed than I hoped it would be. You're all probably rubbing your heads right now saying, oh my God, will he ever shut up? Mark, I couldn't tell. Were you hoping to do the Q&A now, or were you going to do one more thing? I'm done, so Q&A now is good. Okay. Uh, yes, it is a lot, a lot to... Uh, so, we have a few more minutes now. Uh, if you have a question for Clark, uh, Kinga wants to know if it's possible to take another look at the list. Uh, maybe that last one. You can put your question for Clark in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand. That's the third icon over in the participant box. It's Steve, I'm going to rely on you to call on people because for some reason I'm genetically incompetent at detecting when people are actually raising their hands. But no one has done it yet. <laughs> Chat room, really good idea. So there is this sort of interesting dilemma, right, uh, Clark? Um, you know, the, the public education would always have a benefit and a motive for the society as a whole. And it's hard, it's going to be hard to have uh, a conversation that allows that mandated education to be about the individual. Isn't, isn't that sort of ultimately the big dilemma? They won't change unless they have to change, which is where unschoolers and homeschoolers are so important because to the degree that they are losing people that they don't want to lose, uh, then they have to say, how do we meet the needs of the individual? Right now, schools are, and I hate to sound like, like you know, a Russian, Soviet, whatever, but, you know, right now, you know, someone like a president or a prime minister or whatever looks at schools as a national tool of saying, how do we build up science, technology, engineering, and math skills in the United States? Because I look at my chart and we need... 5% of our population to be good at science, technology, engineering, and math, or whatever. Now, how do we use schools to do that? Why not? We'll have every single student take two years of, you know, some kind of rigorous science in order to find the 5% who are good at it. And that, you know, again, from a, from a top-down, you know, uh, nation-building perspective makes quasi-sense. You know, from a parent perspective or whatever, it's like, okay, now my kid's going to hate school and go through these programs that don't work for him or her uh, in order to, be, you know, even though they're not, they're not part of that 5% who are, who are blessed. So, yeah, school, schools as is are part of a national skill-building program, and that's, you know, wonderful. However, it has limitations. So, uh, yes. So, Ermila raised her hand just as I was sort of covering. And uh, Ermila, if you are able to, I'll give you microphone privileges and you can take the microphone now. We have time probably just for your question. Uh, I wanted to know what you mean by badges. Thank you so much. What a great question. Um, the Mozilla Foundation, uh, in conjunction with MacArthur Foundation and a bunch of other things, um, have created what's called uh, badges. And badges are like mini diplomas. Uh, and these mini diplomas can be awarded by institutions. Uh, and so if you are, you know, so uh, they can be very small or very big. So you can earn three or four badges in cybersecurity by attending some small program that, you know, you know that some university is giving or something. So the notion of badges, uh, and again, you know, Look it up. If you don't know what they are, then uh, you know, please dig into them because they're really, really important. It's a great breakthrough of trying to break up the notion of the giant diploma into little mini rewards. Uh, and as part of the badges um, 
So Mo Mozilla has a badges framework, which is XML based. They have what's called their badges backpack, which I think is pretty cool. And so every student can have their backpack. And in their backpack, they have all the badges they've earned from as many different organizations as who are issuers of them. And part of that badge can, so, so if you look at someone's badges, again, you'll see very quickly, oh wow, here's one on cybersecurity, and here's one in penetration testing, and here's one in uh, C++, and here's one in, you know, I guess this person's really interested in, in computers and, uh, and hacking, uh, hopefully a, a white hat, not a black hat. So the notion of, of badges is, is creating little micro certifications that can be given out by anyone. It's an open source framework. So the badges themselves have no inherent value, although they adhere to a very specific format. Uh, but if you go to the right organization and you're, and you're given them, then other organizations, again, let's say Cisco, you know, when looking for new employees, are going to search for everyone who's earned uh, let's say a badge in uh, compiling code or something, uh, or reverse engineering malware or something. So, um, so it, you know, it's a really nice way of getting credit for things in a much more piecemeal way than the giant diploma, which doesn't mean anything to anyone. Clark, thank you so much. We have to close now because we have a discussion starting. Uh, I'm clapping for you. It's the first <laughs> light on. Slow day. clap, clap. Clap. Not easy. Fine. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. The next set of session is starting, so if you're not out of this room in the next one or so, we'll keep you going. Thanks, Clark. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Neil.